that's where the drama comes from. That's where it gets interesting. And if your bad guy was only driven by revenge, I've seen it a million times. We had this comment come in on our channel. Mm -hmm. In a horror movie, only the villain character matters. All the other characters are expendable. Most are going to die anyway. What's your reaction to that? I don't think that's true. If, if no one matters, they shouldn't be in the film. If it's only about that villain, then he should be yo-yoing. Or you know, doing something else that only requires you know him. I think that you're trying to tell a story, and every character is integral to that story, or they shouldn't be there. Maybe that comes from me working with limited budgets always, and you're constantly saying, you know, like why is this person here? Does this person need to be here because they're going to impact me in, as far as scheduling, as far as the budget, da 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 da. And it helps you hone your screenwriting skills better too, because there's nothing extraneous about the script. So to say at any stage that none of these people matter, I think if you're watching the later Friday the 13th movies, if you're watching the later Freddy movies or the later Halloweens, but if you're watching the ones that they started with, you would not say anybody was extraneous in those stories. They, that's when they were still very creative and they had spent a lot of time working on the script and you know, they gave a lot of thought towards it and it was written with love and when you do that when the screenwriter loves those characters there's no way they will be creating people that don't matter there's no way how does a villain in a story reflect the hero um oof if you had asked me this a long time ago um now i i say sometimes my villain and my my hero are almost one in the same they have to pursue whatever their goal is with the same amount of passion. I think that one person learns lessons and the other person doesn't. And that's ultimately what does in the villain. And the villain has to reflect whatever it is, or I shouldn't say the villain has to reflect it, but their goal has to reflect something that the hero is trying to work through so that they can work through. There's a catharsis, you know, as they go through this journey and get to the end and stop this thing from happening. I think that that's the way that it should go, but I, I think that they should both pursue their goals with the same passion and intensity because that's what makes for a great villain. I still consider the, the best villain to be Alan Rickman's character in Die Hard. I think he is the best villain ever because his goal you know, is, is it's the opposite, but they're working towards the same thing, which is him and John McClane. It's just that they're going about it differently. But they're both after this, their goals with the same amount of passion and intensity and being clever. They're both very clever. That's the other thing about it. Like both, both of them are trying to one up the other one and get one over on the other. And that's what's so compelling about watching that story. I think it should be the same with, with any movie that you're working on. Whoever is your antagonist should be going after it with the same amount of intensity and passion. They should be a, almost a, a mirror reflection of the, of the good guy if maybe they made all the wrong decisions in the past. Maybe they didn't make that 51% that Warren Buffett talks about. Maybe they only made the 49% and they, they weren't successful at certain things. Should the antagonist be twice as strong as the hero? No. I think that the villain should always have an advantage. And most of the time, if you if you think about it, if you using Alan Rickman's character in, in Die Hard, um, his advantage was that he already knew what he was trying to accomplish. That was his advantage. He knew what he was trying to accomplish. And because people would say, oh, well, he had the numbers too. He had all these guys with guns. Yeah, but they didn't know who they were looking for. And they didn't know where he was. So that put them put them at a disadvantage. The advantage that the good guy, I mean the bad guy actually had, the villain, was that he knew what he was trying to accomplish and John McClane had to figure it out. So I, I think, you know, I don't think he has to be twice as strong. He just needs to be ahead of the game and the good guy's playing catch up. But you say in the in the end that the antagonist doesn't learn any lessons, but the the hero does. Mm -hmm. So the the antagonist is just it's just all anger, it's all trying to get revenge, 
but the hero somehow learns something? Yeah, the hero has to learn something. He really does. Uh, the villain, I don't think it has to be about anger. I There have been many villains that have done things. I'll give you an example, Moon in the Stars. Um, my villain isn't a guy who's really trying to kill everybody. As a matter of fact, he's trying to save everyone. He's just going about it in a really bad way. What he started to notice, he's been to the edge of the universe and back. He's been to the beginning of time and the end. And what he's seen is that every civilization, every leap, every technological leap they make gets them closer and closer to oblivion. What drives those technological leaps is hope. Hope. Hope that things can be better. Hope that this makes the world a better place. Hope that this gets us to here and hope that this gets us to there. And what we don't account for is what happens when we make those very when we make those mistakes, or when somebody takes what we were using for hope and they weaponize it. Um, those are the things that don't get accounted for. So what his idea is is to create a machine that it shrinks this limbic area in the brain so that hope dies. The problem is when hope dies, so does ambition, so does love, so does fear. So many other emotions die. And what, what happens after that is that his project showed that success, right? It and people had no hope. But then what happened is whether it was a day later or a month later, people would off themselves. And if they didn't off themselves, they became something different. And it became very much like the order of Fanu that, he, that works with him to do these things. So his goal is not one that's out of anger. It's one that's out of love. And you find out that it's to save the people that he still cares about because he's seen what happens in the future. So he needs this to work. Now, the good guys know if you do this, it's the same as a death sentence because it's a ticking time bomb for people just offing themselves, just killing themselves. So he's working just as hard to keep this guy from succeeding. So I don't, I don't think it has to be anger or hatred or, or any of those things. It just has to be a goal that they really believe in, that they are just, they've given everything. There is no plan B, there is only plan A. Both people have a plan A. And what do you do when they're just, God, ah, they're about to collide? You know? That's where the drama comes from. That's where it gets interesting. And if your bad guy was only driven by revenge, I've seen that a million times. Driven by anger, you can beat the anger out of somebody. I've seen it happen a million times, you know, get into a boxing ring and this guy is angry. He won't have all that in three rounds because he's gonna swing for the fences, he'll be exhausted, and you can beat the anger out of him. And he'll give up, because that's all he had was anger. So the most compelling stories come from the people who really believe in their goal, and they're willing to die for their goal. What makes the villain fail is their inability to grow and adapt, because adaptation is survival, right? And the good guy figures it out. They, when they're beaten in that you know, end of the second act, when they're beaten, um, they have to pick up the pieces and learn their lesson. And they're like, I still have the same goal, I just gotta go about it differently. And the, the bad guy, thinking that he's won already, when he sees the bad guy show up again, what does he do? The same exact thing he did to win last time. And that's why he loses. Why is evil important in storytelling? I think it depends on the definition of evil. Um, I think that <clears throat> sometimes people will say evil is like, oh, they do these horrible things. And like if somebody takes, just as an example, and I'm not defending at all, but let's say they take someone like Hitler, right? And they say, you see all the horrible things he did. It's evil. I go, I think he's despicable. I think the atrocities are evil. But true evil is doing it just because. That's true evil. He didn't do it just because. 
he did it because he believed this and he believed that and he believed this crazy stuff. And he was like, the only way to do it is to do this. To me, true evil is something that is, is birthed rotten and it has no reason to exist other than to cause you harm. True evil is terrifying. True evil doesn't need a reason. It just doesn't. Michael Myers did not need a reason. That's what made him so terrifying. Nothing happened to make him stab his sister and her boyfriend to death. Nothing happened. That's scary. I think you very rarely though see true evil in movies because it's something hard to capture. It's something really hard to capture. People that just do things because why not? Those are the things that I think in, in reality scare the crap out of me. When you hear about this serial killer who just, you ask, why did you do this? Why not? That's evil. That's terrifying. But it's rarely, rarely portrayed very well in films.